Maybe I can just explain to them. Uh, hi, hi, Dan, RKD. Uh, hello. Hi, Rahul. I'm sorry hi. I went down with COVID. <laughs> No, no worries. I, I think a lot of people uh, <laughs> have heard got that. Uh, hopefully it's mild. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we will uh, begin. So we'll begin with uh, an hour of uh, the uh, GU's uh, presentation. And then we can open it to question and answer. And uh, and then uh, uh, he will step out and then the committee members uh, can uh, discuss and, and give him the verdict after he comes back. Yeah, so I, I expect us to be wrapped up before two. Thank you. And and G, you, you'll be able to share your slides here on the Zoom too, because the the um the transmission. Oh, yes, but I share the screen. Great. We should share it together. Can you even record it? Hi, Arkady. How are you? Yes. I'm fine. No, oh, that's much better. You can go into slideshow show one that I can present. Yeah. You did all this work on beautiful slides. I want to see them in high resolution, you know. <laughs> Record in the cloud. Yes, it is. All right, so uh, this is a uh, uh, GUE's uh, proposal, uh, uh, the, the defense. And uh, so he will give his presentation for an hour and uh, then we can have question and answer. Uh, the committee members, the chairperson of the committee is Professor René Vidal. And we are joined with the committee with uh, Professor and Dr. Daniel Hashimoto and Professor RKD uh, Purso. All right, and I'm Rahul Mangara. Hi, everyone. Welcome to my PhD defense. My name is Ji Yue, and my research topic is patient-specific electrophysiology heart model for assisting left atrium arrhythmia ablation. This figure is a comparison between a healthy heart and a diseased heart. For a healthy heart, there is a regular sequence of activations coming from the atrium to the ventricle. But for a diseased heart, the activations are irregular, causing efficiency uh, cannot be so the heart cannot be sufficiently pumped blood. In America, millions of people have this disease, and it causes hundreds of thousands of deaths each year. The symptoms include fast heartbeat, chest pain, dizziness, shortness of breath, and more. There are several treatments. The major ones are medicine, surgery, and lifestyle changes. We focus on the catheter ablation surgery. During the surgery, the catheters, which I show in my hand here, is inserted through the vein to the heart. And this is a mapping catheter. It has electrodes on it. It's going to record endocardium electrograms. And based on those informations, physicians go in with an ablation catheter as shown here. The tip of the ablation catheter will generate heat to kill abnormal cells to restore the normal activation. Here are some photos of the operating room. There is a patient table behind the glass and multiple computer screens displaying the mapping system's information which includes spatial data and temporal data. And we also have x-ray and echocardiograph alongside the mapping system. And this will be the patient data we work with. Catheter ablation is a minimally invasive surgery. The catheters are inserted through a vein to the heart. It can be go through uh, the groin the shoulder or neck. Then the 3D mapping system takes in the measurements and displays it on the atrium. Here I show you an example of a catheter ablation. At the top, we see that there are two lines of 
ablations, those are to block the abnormal activations coming from the pulmonary veins. The veins are here so that the abnormal activations will stop with confined in that region that will not go into the aging. So this is called a pulmonary vein isolation. But sometimes this will be not enough to stop the arrhythmia because there are additional sources as shown in the bottom here. We find a focal source. A focal source is a source, it's a point source that given out abnormal activations. And we can see the physicians apply a cluster of ablations to the focal source to stop their uh, abnormal activations. A typical ablation procedure runs for three to six hours. The first one to two hours is the preparation step. The patient is getting sedation anesthesia and the physician, nurse, the technicians, they prepare the hardware and software. And then the physician insert the catheter into the patient. Then there is the initial mapping step, which takes about half an hour, which the physician maneuvers the catheter to cover the entire left atrium to create a map. This map is usually um, called a voltage map. So voltage map is a map to identify scar tissues. So based on the scar tissue distributions, the physician is going to do a standard ablation. Usually that will be the pulmonary vein isolation. And if this does not stop the arrhythmia, then we will need to do additional ablations. This will be a back and forth of mapping and ablation. It can take a few hours if the arrhythmia is complex. So after all the sources are ablated, then the procedure ends. And at the end, the uh, catheters are removed and nurses clean up the operating room. So this takes about one hour. We develop an integrated system that provides assistance in these three steps. These three steps here. There are many companies making different types of mapping systems as shown here. So four different types of mapping systems. They are similar. What they do is they take measurements from the left atrium and interpolate it into the atrium geometry and display it as a color map. And based on that, the physician is going to do their ablations. And what we come in is that we integrate the heart model to this system. Uh, the advantage of doing that is we can reduce measurement noise and we can do more analysis and we can provide more ablation assistance with our heart model. We are the first to integrate the heart model to a clinical mapping system. And our heart model acts as a digital twin. Our integrated system do not require any data outside of the mapping system. Also, we tested our system in the operating room. So we have our heart model one running alongside with the clinical system. And we let the physicians to compare the results. In order to build such an integrated system, we ask ourselves some scientific questions. And here are the three questions we ask. What are the weaknesses of the current mapping system? We think that the major ones are the electrograms are recordings are temporally asynchronous and spatially non-uniform. The available maps to help find arrhythmia source locations are limited. And patient data contains noise. The next question is, what can the man pain system benefit from a heart model? We believe that a heart model can provide patient-specific whole atrium simulation with uh, which is synchronous, uniform, and noise-free. And then it can produce ablation guidance maps for arrhythmia source detection. Also, with a heart model, we can simulate ablation before irreversibly apply those lesions. 
And the last question we ask is how to integrate such a hard model to the mapping system. We need to process and clean up patient data. We need to develop patient-specific tuning methods. And we need to implement GPU computing to enable real-time simulation so that it will be practical in the clinical room. Solving those questions, we achieve several contributions. The core contributions are, we investigated the fiber defects on activation patterns. We develop a fast model tuning method, and we achieve high accuracy of simulating arrhythmia. In order to achieve these core contributions, we also need to build several tools, user interfaces, and algorithms to process the patient data. We will need to develop additional maps for assisting ablation, and we validated our system with patient data. Here are my publications. I have six papers published in the top journals and international conferences. And one paper about fiber effects has been selected as a feature article on the ranked number three journal by Google Scholar. Atrial arrhythmia ablation is challenging. Arrhythmia reoccurrence within 12 months is about 45%. That's very high. So there is a room for improvements. We think that there are mainly three challenges. The first one is about data sampling. One problem is that the data samples are temporally asynchronous. We can see that from uh, figure B to C, the samples are acquired section by section by this mapping catheter. So physician maneuvers these to different regions. So they are acquired at different time. But the pattern of the arrhythmia can change during this 10 to 20 minutes of sampling. The other problem is the samples are spatially non-uniform because maneuvering and keeping the capsule at the same location is technically challenging. As a result, some regions will overlap and some regions disjoint. The other challenge is that the electron recordings is not easy to process. So here I show some of the problems. If figure A here, shows a good catheter placement. We can see that all the splines, they are spread out. But in figure B, notice that the splines are twisted and they can cause the electrodes to collide with each other, which creates noise. Another problem is about the catheter movement. So figure C here is a nice, stable catheter position during the recording. The recording is hold there for 2.5 seconds. So during the 2.5 seconds, in figure C, the catheter is very stable. But in figure D, you can see that the catheter has a very large movement. The problem with catheter movement is that it will no longer has any meaning because it's not recording the same location. Here is another problem. It's about processing the electrogram. This is a very easy and clean electrogram. We can see that the activations are very clear. But sometimes we have fractionated electrograms, which multiple local activations are detected. And it's difficult to separate out those multiple activations into just one group of activation. Another problem is we will have some uh, bipolar recording direction dependency problem. So what this problem is, is that if the bipolar orientation shown here is parallel to the activation wave direction, then it's going to record a strong signal as shown here. But if the bipolar orientation is perpendicular to the activation wave direction, then it will record nothing because bipolar is a subtraction of the two unipolar. And physicians like to use this because by doing so, it can avoid many noise. But then it has this direction dependency problem. So this problem affects the detection of scars. 
because low voltage signifies scar. What if this low voltage is coming as a result of the bipolar orientation? Then we could misclassify healthy tissue to scar. Here is data interpolation problem. Interpolation can introduce data outliers. So the blue dots here are the data points we acquired. We need to interpolate them into the atrium mesh. And as you can see that within this yellow circle, there are some smaller greenish regions. This does not make much sense. They can be interpolation errors. And lastly, we have ventricle interferences. You can see that this is an endocardium electrograph, but there are three very large signals here. They actually come from ventricle because ventricle has much stronger muscles. The ventricle contractions oftentimes get picked up in the atrium. So we need to remove these ventricle interferences. And the third challenge is that identify arrhythmia source locations is difficult. The biggest question we have is where to ablate. Voltage map could help physician to find scar distributions, but that depends on a correct choice of voltage threshold. Activation map can help identify focal source locations, but it depends on the time window of interest. And phase singularity tracking can help physicians to find the rotor source locations, but doing the tracking is not a trivial task. Furthermore, uh, multiple arrhythmia sources often appear simultaneously, perpetuating atrial fibrillation. Given so many challenges, uh, it ins they inspire a lot of research. So here I would like to show you two state-of-the-art related work. The first one is based on MRI data. It only requires the MRI scans. It does not use the electrogram. And it implements one set of parameters for healthy tissue and another set for scar. But the computation takes two to five days to do. The second one is a simulation model reflective of anatomies, fiber orientations, and electrophysiologies. They utilize clinical voltage maps, activation maps, and CT scans. So take a note that CT scans is not available within the ablation procedure operating room. And then they use myocardial fiber orientations from atlases. So here it is from atlases, it's not the real patient because that's also not available. And then it, similar to the first one, it implements two sets of parameters, one for healthy tissue and one for scar. And it takes 48 minutes to load and analyze data much faster. So compared to our approach, we do not acquire any data outside of the operating room. And our parameter tunings are more refined. We have locally tuned continuous value parameters. And our model runs fast. The tuning takes only 15 seconds and simulation for one heartbeat takes about just five seconds. Here is the overview of our approach. So physicians gather data in the operating room and this mapping data as shown here, is processed into local tissue properties that we fit into our heart model. And this will be uh, an optimization step. So it involves iterative tunings to get our model to tune to patient-specific. So after that, our model can simulate patient-specific arrhythmias. And analyzing these patient-specific simulations, we can provide electroanatomical maps which guide the ablation. And here we are not just providing one type of map, we can provide many types. And I'm going to show six types near the end of the presentation. So these five steps creates a loop. 
where the physician continuously acquire more data as more and more ablations are done. And the model gets constant updates. So it's like a mapping and ablation, mapping and ablation until the arrhythmia terminates. Why we integrate the heart model to the mapping system? Because having a map heart model can provide a lot more. So let's first take a look at what can the current ablation system provide. It can provide a voltage map, which will show the scar tissue locations. It can provide an activation map, uh, which will identify the focal source locations. And it can provide a coherent map. This is used to check the ablation block leakage. <clears throat> what can our integrated system provide? All of the above and additional ablation guidance maps. Also, we can run arrhythmia simulations and ablation simulations, and we can locate arrhythmia sources based on all this analysis. What makes our approach different? Our system is highly integrated into the current mapping system in the operating room. We utilize patient data that is available during the ablation procedure. And our patient specific tuning is more detailed. And our heart model can run in real time. It runs in seconds. So for like a three to six hour procedure, we say that that's in real time. These are the result summaries. We were the first to integrate a heart model that can run in real time to a clinical mapping system that does not require data outside of the clinical operating room. <laughs> we were the first to rigorously investigate the fiber effects on left atrium arrhythmia activation patterns. And our heart model is accurate and clinically practical. We can simulate focal and rotor arrhythmias with high accuracy. We can predict focal and rotor arrhythmias, and it can run in real time. Our algorithms improve electroanatomical map accuracy for ablation guidance, and we validated our system with patient data. In the following slides, I'm going to present my research in two sections. Section one, I'm going to present our core contributions, which are the fiber defense model tuning and the model accuracy. This is to solve challenge one, the data sampling challenge. And then in section two, I will briefly showcase the supporting contributions we have, which are process clinical data and ablation guidance maps and system validation. So these are to solve challenge two, the data processing, and challenge three, the arrhythmia source detection problem. So let's dive into section one. In order to tune our heart model to patient-specific, we need to have patient-specific parameters. So from the clinical data, we have a lot of um, data that can transform into heart model components. For example, the 3D geometry, the heart parameters, and the arrhythmia states. But there is one problem. We do not have fiber data in the clinical setup, but that's required in a heart model. We don't want to introduce new equipment or new procedures in the operating room. So we think, how can we compensate for the lack of fiber? In order to do that, we need to first learn about the fiber defects on activation patterns. We started with a slab simulation. So here, there are two rows, uh, different experiments. We vary the angle between the endocardium and epicardium fibers. We also vary the angle of the activation directions, creating a total of 50 scenarios. Here, the first row here, 
shows the scenarios where the two layers are the same orientation. And we can see that depending on the activation wave direction, the conduction speed can vary a lot. You see, this is how, how much they varied depending on the conduction direction. But the experiments on the bottom row here, the two layers of fibers are perpendicular. So such effects become much less. You can see that the conduction velocity is roughly the same. And we also find out that the thickness ratio between the endocardium and epicardium can affect conduction velocity too. So as shown in here, the top two rows, both layers have the same thickness. And then we can see that the activation wave is going to land in the same location. But if we have a much larger th thickness in the endocardium than the epicardium, as shown in the bottom two row, then we will see that the activation waveform can be in different locations because they have different conduction speed. So what we observe is in an ideal slab tissue, fiber orientation could have a large effect on the activation patterns. However, left atrium is not a slab tissue. So fiber orient organizations in the left atrium is more complex. So the question now we have is, will the observations from the slab experiment still hold true in the left atrium? So this is what we did to investigate that. We work on an ex vivo fiber data. So these data are high resolution atrium scans, but that's ex vivo from cadavers. So each one takes 50 hours to scan. We have high resolution fibers and high resolution atrial geometries. And what we do is we register seven different patients onto the same patient's geometry. So the variable here is only fiber. And then for each fiber, we run the same set of six different arrhythmia simulations, creating a total of 42 experiments. Then we compare the results to see that how much differences is caused by the fiber orientation. This is how we do fiber registration because we have different geometries. So first we need to apply a non-rigid iterative process point transformation to transform one mesh to another. Here you see that the magenta mesh is transformed to the shape of the blue mesh. And then we need to apply a reference frame transformation to correct the 3D fiber vectors. Here are the results. What you see here is that for each row is the same arrhythmia simulation. The differences is in different fibers. So fiber one through seven. We can see that all these results within the same row are very similar. And the average activation time difference is just about 7.8 milliseconds or 4.3% of the entire activation time range. But when we take a closer look at regions, we do find that fibers has local effects. As shown here, if the local fibers are perpendicular to the activation wave, then the conduction speed is slower. And if the local fibers are parallel to the activation wave direction, then the conduction speed is faster, but such effect does not accumulate across the entire left atrium. So here is what happens. Figure A is the endocardium fiber and figure B is the epicardium fiber. We can see that the fiber organizations uh, varies a lot. And then figure C is the fiber angle difference map. So previously in the slab experiments, we observed that if the two layers fibers are the same, then it could have a large effect on conduction speed. If the two layers fibers are perpendicular, then they have less. So when the activation wave goes through the red arrow, the path of the red arrow, it can go through spaces that increase the speed and go through 
regions that decrease the speed. And then overall, it does not change much. And here is an example. So we analyze the path from the earliest activation time to the latest, which is the path A, B here. And then this is the conduction speed along this path A, B. We can see that it's going up and down. But when we calculate the average, it's roughly the same, regardless of fiber orientations or the activation directions. Before going to the model tuning, I would like to first explain how the model is computed. So we have uh, patient data, and then let's say that the model is tuned now. So how to compute the simulation forward? So what we need to do is we need to give the model some initial state. So it's the initial values at time zero of each, each of the vertex on the mesh. Those will initiate uh, arrhythmias. And then we solve the how model equations, uh, time step by time step, then it will create a simulation. And this is the math behind the hard model. It's shown here. It's a set of differential equations. We have parameters that uh, affect the shape of the action potential. And then we have parameters that affect the activation propagation. The tuning of the model is to tune these parameters so that it fits the patient data. And after it's tuned, every location will have its own set of parameter values. So this is different from the other research groups. So we have individual values for individual vertex here. In order to compute the differential equations, we discretize the heart into space. In order to do that, we create a Cartesian node space wrapping around the left atrium. So it's we create all the Cartesian nodes within a radius of each vertex, and the result will be Cartesian nodes wrapping around the left atrium. And then we also discretize the equations in time using the explicit Euler's method. So that given the values at time zero, we can compute time one and so on. And for the diffusion, we assume no flux boundary conditions, and we implement a 19 node stencil. The diffusion is controlling how the activation is propagating from one node to its neighbors. Here, this is the diffusion from the red node to its 18 neighbors. And we also implement GPU parallel computing. We first allocate the variables from CPU to GPU, and then we have a loop of the time within the loop, each node is computed in GPU in parallel. And then we gather the results to analyze and display. This is how we achieve one heartbeat in five seconds computation time on a personal computer. Here are some results, uh, example results of what our model can simulate. For example, the photoarrhythmia where the activation comes from an abnormal location, rotor arrhythmia, where we have spiral waves causing irregular heartbeat, and ZZ propagation. This is caused by uh, irregular distributions of scar that creates tunnels of varying conduction speeds. And then lastly, atrial fibrillation. This is a very chaotic rhythm, and it's the most difficult atrial fibrillation. Now, let me explain how the model is tuned. So why, why would, do we need to tune the model? Because fiber data is not available. And then we want to compensate for that. The way to do that is we tune a diffusion coefficient. But it's challenging, as shown in the plot on the top here. You can see that a change in the diffusion coefficient does not immediately causing a change of the conduction velocity. There's a lag behind. And also the tuning is sensitive to initial values 
adjustment steps and ending criteria, etc. To overcome these challenges, we develop an optimization process. What we do is we first process the patient data. This will give us the patient's local activation time, and we treat this as the ground truth. And then we give some initial diffusion values to our simulation, which will generate the local activation time of simulations. And then we take their differences. According to the difference, we update the diffusion coefficient and then goes to the next iteration. The goal here is to minimize the difference between our simulation result and the patient's ground truth. We also exploit the relation of conduction velocity and diffusion coefficient to reduce the iterations we need to tune the model. And here we can see that after the tuning is done, the scars are taken care of too. What I mean here is, you can see the figure on the left, the red regions are scar regions we specify. They have very low conduction. And then the figure on the left is a map of the diffusion coefficients. Red represents low values, blue represents high values. And we can see that these red regions match the true scar regions very well. And then we tested the two model on seven patient data. We have achieved a local activation time accuracy of 96% for focal arrhythmia. And we achieved accuracy of 93% for rotor arrhythmia. This is a comparison of our model's performance to other research groups. We can see that our hard model is quite accurate, nearly twice as good. And then our computation time is much faster. But we do have limitations in our hard model. And the limitation mostly come from the fact that we do not have fiber data, although we tune for it. But <clears throat> For some examples here, <clears throat> this is the identification of the latest activation regions. So figure B shows that our model is able to predict some regions, but there's one region that it missed. But most of the time, the model is quite accurate because, for example, in figure A here, all of the three latest activation locations are predicted. Here is uh, another limitation on simulating meandering rotors. Blue dots are the rotating center of our model, which is fiber independent. And red dots are the rotor centers of a fiber inclusive model. So we can see that if the heart includes some fibers, the rotors can shift as shown in here. But our model's rotor does not shift. So this creates an error. And we further investigate what's happening in the fibers there, what causes the rotors to shift. So we run another set of experiments. What we find out is that um, the fiber gradient has a very large effect on the drifting of the rotor. So you can see in the column F, because this fiber has a continuously curve, so it makes the center of the rotation shift as shown in the red arrow. So now we finish section one. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about section two. Let's be in section two. These are example files of the clinical data we have. They contain 3D triangular mesh, the character locations, electrograms, and more. These data are exported from the mapping system. They are proprietary, so we need to decipher them. And also, the atrium geometry and the electrogram needs some processing to clean up. 
Here is an example of the atrium geometry. These three figures shows how this geometry is being created. So as the catheter with, uh, sweeping through the inside of the left atrium, the geometry is being added bit by bit, and then it becomes the left atrium. But this mesh contains a lot of defects. For example, deep concave holes in the setting and triangular faces or non-reference vertices. Uh, we built an automatic program to fix this issue. So after the mesh is refined, we can see that our triangles are very uh, small and they are uniform. And there's no defects in this refined geometry. After that, we need to cut the pulmonary veins and the mitral valve. We build a user interface for doing that. This is showing that a region marked in blue is selected, and then we can remove it. And this figure shows the result of all the veins are removed. And the way we do that, this is the algorithm for selecting a region, the, the blue region. So we need to do this, we first select some of the boundary points and then select a point within this region. Then our program will link these boundary points to the boundary lines. And then starting from the center region is going to expand out until it hits the boundary. This is how a region is selected. So after this is selected, we can delete that or we can uh, insert new triangles because sometimes we have spiky regions or we can have deep concave regions. So we want to flatten it out. What we do is we first select this region and then we delete it and then we insert new triangles. So this result is much flatter than this spiky one. And now I would like to talk about how we remove the ventricle KRS interferences. We develop an algorithm to do that. It contains mainly three steps. The first step, uh, well, I, I have to uh, first explain that we are working on a segment of the recording. What I mean by that is a segment contains 20 electrodes here. So we have 20 electrograms recorded at the same time. So this is the uh, electron we work with. We will first subtract the medium out of these 20 electrograms. And then we find the QRS timing by a morphology template. We first assess the 12th surface lead electrogram to find a rough timing of the QRS, the ventricle signals. And then we align it to the coronary sinus because the coronary sinus is the catheter that's very near the boundary of the uh, atrium. It's mostly atrium signal there. And then we create a morphology around those ventricle signals. And then we, from there, multiple uh, morphologies, we create a medium template. And then we will subtract that template from all these electrograms. This is an example of the result. We can see that before the QRS removal, um, there are three QRS interferences. And this is after the interference are removed. We can see that the atrium signal preserve well. And after that, we have a much cleaner endocardium electrogram. We will need to identify local activations. And what we do is we first process the original electrogram, which is in figure A. We take the absolute value and we smooth it a little bit. And then we find the peaks of this smooth electrogram, the process and smooth electrogram. This will give us a rough timing for us to create a template. So the template is shown in C here. This is a medium of all these red boxes. And then we cross correlate this template to the original signal, creating the correlation coefficient signal here. And then we find the peaks on that. So this will be the more accurate local activation time. But sometimes you will end up with a long interval as shown here. 
because of our threshold selections. We would go back into the long intervals and then check the coefficient signal again to determine if additional activation should be inserted. So with all these processes, we can then create ablation guidance maps. This is how we do that. It all comes from the patient data. And then from the clean lab electrograms, we can extract features like voltage, dominant frequency, fractionation, and synchrony. And then we do the activation timing detection. From that, we can extract information like local activation time and cycle length. And from the activation timing, we can create an activation movie, which can then be converted into conduction velocity and phase singularity. These are all features very helpful to create into a map for precision. So what we do is we will interpolate this data on the geometry. If this is for uh, this is from patient data, but if this is simulation data, then we don't need any interpolation. So this data will be on the mesh. It's going to be color coded. That's what we call uh, electroanatomical map. This is for guiding ablation. I would like to explain a little bit detail of two of the most useful maps, the voltage maps mentioned several times now. So it is a map to use color to represent the electron amplitude. Uh, here is a clinical example. The physician here is doing a pulmonary vein isolation. It's a redo patient, which means the patient has done this procedure before. But about a year later, since the reoccurrence rate is 45%, it's probably going back to a redo. And what happened is that the previous ablation scars, they may grow back to conductive. So to find out where are they, we need to do a voltage map. So this voltage map shows that there is a leakage in this region. That's why the physician coming back and do more ablations to bridge these two places so that the activations, the abnormal activations coming from the pulmonary vein will stop getting into the atrium. And this is an activation map. It's also mentioned several times now. So it's, it's a map that's using color to represent the sequence of activation. So we can see that this is an activation movie. Activation comes from here and goes to the uh, goes there. So it's represented by the color. And this is a clinical example. So what happens with a disease heart is that sometimes in some real locations, you might have a focal source where this uh, causing activations, but not in the correct location. So that's why physicians need to identify that. You see this red region, they identify it and then apply that. Once the cells are killed, they will not give in activations anymore. But local activation time map is highly depending on the choice of time window of interest. Sometimes it's not that easy to do to have the correct choice. Here is an example to see what happens. Like coming from the same activation, we created two local activation times. The only difference is in the choice of the time window of inches. So physicians are trained to look for the red because red means earliest. But if you started as somewhere in the middle, the earliest will be somewhere in the middle. So that doesn't make much sense. It can be confusing for the physician. So usually they will spend a lot of time adjusting the time window of inches in order to find a map that looks like A1 that they can believe. But this is not a problem for our program because all we need to do is find the local minima. As shown here, the local minima is always at the black dot location. So our analytical system tools can make what is invisible visible. These are some of the uh, examples of those features converted into electroanatomical maps. And it's good to point out that these maps are coming from real patients. 
So figure A, B, C, D are processed from real patient data. And what we can identify is there is a region that's circled by the uh, black here is identified as ablation targets on all four of them. So that gives us high confidence to ablate that black region search uh, because we would believe that at least ablating that region will stop the regional arrhythmia. And lastly, we validate our system with patient data. Here is a scatter plot of patient data versus simulation data. If our model is 100% accurate, then all the blue dots should be on the red line. But we can see that our blue dots are very closely along the red line, and we have high correlation values. This means our model is very accurate. Visually, this is um, how our model performs. Here, I'm showing tachycardia patient data. The ground truth is on the left, and our model gener generated results are on the right. So in comparison, we can see that they are very close to each other. And the result of these seven atrial tachycardia patients is that we achieve an average activation time error of 10 milliseconds with an average correlation of 0 0.81. We have even better results for sinus rhythm where we have the average activation time error of five milliseconds and the average correlation of 0 0.95. Uh, you, may, you may say that, well, sinus rhythm is a healthy heart. So what's the point of having, what, what, what's the practical use of having the model run good on that? Well, it is very practical because most of the time when the patient has atrial fibrillation, it gets into the operating room, physicians will choose to cardiovert the patient so that it's going to be in sinus rhythm. And having an accurate sinus rhythm map, we can have an accurate voltage map out of it to identify the scar regions for the procedures. In conclusion, we have integrated a system for clinical atrial arrhythmia ablation. And our core contribution is we investigated the fiber effects on activation patterns we develop a fast model tuning method and we achieve high accuracy of simulating arrhythmias. To achieve all of this, we also build several tools, user interfaces and algorithms to process the patient data. And we develop additional maps for assisting ablation and we validated our system with patient data. And here I would like to thank my parents they always gave me unconditional support. My mom is a doctor. <laughs> and I would like to uh, give my sincere thanks to my advisor, Professor Rahul Mangaram. <laughs> and our collaborators here in the United States and overseas in France and United Kingdoms. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.